Okay, great. So thanks. So I'm, I'm, I'm also going to be talking about this um, sort of science policy interface, and in a way that's not completely discontinuous with what Jonathan said. So, so in, in fact, I mean, I, I, what I hope to do is, is be relatively brief, and be very happy for sort of questions to be directed at much as at Jonathan as, as many in the, in, the, in the little space that we have available, and then of course we can continue with it later. Um, I mean, one difference here is that I, I, I sort of hold this um, background view that it's very difficult to talk about what um, uh, what kind of advice, what form it should take, and how disagreements and so on should be resolved without understanding how that advice is going to be used. And, and, and that's partly a descriptive exercise, but I think I also want to say a little bit about how it should be used. Um, and it's uh, uh, and in a way, the sort of you know one should work then back downstream from. So this is what you want. Ideally, a policymaker wants to find themselves with you know this kind of help. So you know how do we have to organise things so that we can make sure that that help is is provided? That's the sort of perspective that I want to take on. So I, I will say um, a little bit about. So it's hence the precautionary decisions part of the talk. I want to say a little bit about precautionary decision making and what that might mean as a kind of backdrop to sort of what scientific advising looks like if it's in a context in which there's going to be some precautionary decision making downstream. Um, so that's that's one sort of you know uh, uh, preliminary comment. The other is I, I'm sort of really I'm thinking about scientific advice within crises. It's a sort of interesting philosophical question, what makes a thing a crisis, as it were, from, <laughs> from routine. Uh, I, I guess one thing that's, that makes something a crisis is that there's a sort of harm that's significant in some kind of way. Uh, I, I, I'm going to press for the idea that there are sort of harms that are system disruptive in some sort of significant way, which makes the, um, the, the problem of handling it sort of a non-routine matter. So it's your, you're facing a situation in which sort of standard procedures for dealing with things are disrupted because of the scale of the, the potential harm. Uh, so that's a sort of loose thought about what a crisis is. I mean, sometimes these crises, and, and the COVID one is clearly a case in point, it means you have to kind of hurry up um, with your decision making. But I mean, in some ways, the sort of climate crisis has been a slow crisis. It's now, it's now getting faster in some ways. But, but so the urgency is a, a common characteristic, maybe, maybe not the essential characteristic of this kind of thing. Anyway, so, so in that kind of context, of course, uh, I'm sort of thinking here, policy makers are, are going to rely heavily on the advice of experts about how to manage the crisis, and in particular to what view they should take about the emerging harm, the threat of harm, um, and rely on them in, in sort of two ways, both in providing some kind of picture or information more generally about the likely or possible um, outcomes of either taking or not taking certain kinds of actions in response to it, but also in providing you know, more direct recommendations about what sort of actions might be taken um, and that sort of have some sort of scientific support. So there's a certain amount of kind of horizon scanning. Part of this is sort of scientists may be aware of possibilities, both action possibilities, but also sort of contingent threats and so on, um, that, that you know, it's not within the mental space of the policymakers. We're out of the routine setup here. And, and the main issue here, I mean, in the main sort of question um, here, I think, is about um, how decisions or interventions um, can be made in the absence of anything like full scientific certainty or full scientific understanding or indeed or an agreement about uh, the nature of the threat and what sort of actions will be effective. In dealing with it, so 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 the, the, the sort of main pro issue for me is how to, to manage um, both that, that that sort of lack of certainty should be managed both within the policy process but also within um, the process of scientific advice. So that's the kind of thing. So there's sort of two distinct questions: how should decisions be made in these kind of conditions, and what form should scientific advice take when there's this sort of meta understanding that any advice is sort of in some sense. Uh, uh, made on the basis of a less than full understanding of the, of the situation. So let me start by saying a little, little bit about um, the decision making side. To it. So, so the, you know, the, the theoretical literature will, at least in, in this kind of field, will tell you that there are two primary approaches. This is sort of basically an optimizing view. <laughs> what, what policymakers should do is they should have some kind of 
notion of what benefit to their constituency is, and they should pick policies that maximize that benefit in expectation. And of course, that kind of approach is quite information heavy. It's hungry, if you like. It requires not only sort of to have these um, in, in full evaluative judgments, but also you know, enough information to form precise expectations about what would or would not happen, will or will not happen if certain actions are performed. And then, you know, in, in contrast to that, the, the precautionary approach is often sort of um, posited as the alternative to this kind of thinking. Um, it's a, a kind of a, an approach that largely only has significant force of favor within environmental areas, broadly speaking. I mean, it seems to be almost entirely absent within economics and statistics and other areas in engineering problems and so on but but the sort of the great virtue at least uh, as uh, many of its advocates say is that it's a kind of approach that, that works even if um, this data evidence scarcity or lack of less than full scientific understanding so it's a, something you can do when you're unable to optimize um, for lack of, of uh, um, certainty about the outcomes of your actions so uh, in, in comparing these things, I think it's sort of important to be clear about what's not in dispute here. I mean, I think whether whichever of the, these approaches one takes, it's very important to be as comprehensive as, or as global as, what, as one can be in an assessment of the outcomes of possible interventions. Uh, it's a, something that Joe and I have stressed uh, quite a lot in, in, in sort of in work that we've done before. But, but it is something that's very difficult in these circumstances, and it's in the nature of scientific advice in crises that it tends to be focused on a single kind of outcome. And you know, we know from the COVID thing that this has often created problems. Um, I also don't think that it's sort of really the, the interesting part of this dispute is about whether um, you know, optimizing thinking is the right thing to do in conditions of full certainty, scientific certainty. I mean, where you, where you have something like precise probabilities there, is of course a, now a, a, bit, a very sizable literature arguing for forms of caution which standard expected utility theory can't manage. But that is sort of tangential to, um, to the problem that I want to talk about here. So, that, so the, really, the 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 the, uh, um, the precautionary approach, as I see it, gets its oxygen from um, two things. Firstly, the significance of the harm that's being confronted, and secondly, the lack of um, uh, the gaps in scientific understanding about the, 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 the consequences of performing certain kinds of interventions or, or not. Um, you know, the problem here is sort of uh, the, although there are lots of kind of things like the famous precautionary principle, there's very little clarity on what it actually means to, to act precautiously <laughs> or with caution. It's, it's very hard actually to say what that amounts to. Uh, I, when you, when you try and turn the precautionary principle into some kind of decision principle, you know, the, the literature is full of you know, impossibility results, and stories about how this leads to contradiction and so on. Uh, and I think that's probably the wrong way to think, of, think about it. You should really sort of think about the principle as a, as a kind of call to take seriously um, the lack of, of, of certainty in, in one's, in one's decision-making. Um, so the main, uh, as I said, uh, although the, uh, uh, I mean, this idea that it's the lack of uh, scientific certainty that along with the high stakes that provides the main grounds for precaution um, seems to sort of fit well with the, with the way in which the, um, the scientific advice operated during the COVID pandemic, I mean, SAGE, uh, largely eschewed offering probabilities for anything. Instead, what they did was constructed scenarios. Um, and in particular, there was a great deal of focus on the so-called reasonable worst case scenario, um, with the idea being, apparently being, but it's not explicit in anything that they do, that the worst case scenario is the thing that one should act uh, precautiously towards. So uh, 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 somehow, uh, but in ways that are not made completely clear, uh, the, the fact that something is the reasonable worst case should make it figure prominent, more prominently than other scenarios in thinking about what to do. And there's lots of different ways in which one, one could spell out that, that thought. I mean, one thing that, that's very common in the literature is to, 
think that, that what that requires one to do is something like um, pick the action which gives us the least bad reasonable worst case outcome. <laughs> okay, so that's the sort of mini-maxing idea um, when built around scenarios. But, but I, I, I'm not convinced that that really does, um, that, that really captures what's going on here, at least implicitly in, in the thinking that's guiding the advice here. The idea seems to be more, and this is where the sort of systems collapse comes out here, is that there are certain, there, there's a thresholds in the system that you're thinking about, and in this case, it's particularly the health system that, that's occupying people's attention, where things get sufficiently bad that there's a risk that the whole thing falls apart. And so the, so the, the possibility of NHS collapse is a sort of salient uh, possibility in the thinking of the advisors, and presumably in part that's because the, the policymakers are communicating worries about that as well. Um, so the idea here seems to be not so much sort of minimizing, uh, picking the, the, the least bad worst case, but doing something like op optimizing subject to the constraint that you should keep the probability of a realization of the worst case to a minimum or to below some sort of threshold. So this is obviously a sort of very complicated idea because probabilistic thinking is creeping back in here. And indeed, one might think as soon as you start talking about reasonable worst case already there's some sort of probabilistic evaluation that's going on here. So, so the, the, my main point here is that even if this is anything um, uh, right about this, precautionary thinking is, is more information hungry than, than it's, it's sometimes <laughs> advertised as. And secondly, if there, if there is a kind of clear rationale for uh, taking precaution, precautious action, it lies in this idea of being able to robustly uh, avoid certain kinds of catastrophic situations. Or, I mean, let's say more generally, robustly achieve uh, your goals, and here in these contexts, your goals is avoiding a certain kind of significant harm. Um, uh, uh, what do I mean by robust? Well, robust against the range of reasonable opinion that's coming out of the scientific community. So, so that's the sort of the precautionary background for the kind of scientific advice that one wants is contained in this idea of, of seeking robustness. That's, that's sort of it's for my, my first claim here. Um, reasonable precautious action is, is robustness seeking relative to the state of scientific understanding. All right, so let me say something about what um, that means for scientific advice. Uh, and uh, uh, starting as just with a sort of observation that uh, there's a sort of great deal of, I mean, the, the, the system for providing scientific advice in the UK, at least, is, is relatively mature. It's often sort of hailed internationally as a sort of very grown-up system. It's very explicit. There's a national risk register which, which very clearly sets out the duties of scientific advisors. Um, and these are uh, threefold. They're supposed to provide a, a, a scientific assessment of the state of scientific understanding of the risk that's concerned. But which is what one would expect. But it's also they're also required by the risk register to offer policy recommendations for risk mitigation. So to do the normatively heavy stuff, it's built into the, the duties. And the third task that they're, um, they're required under this thing to do is to provide a reflection on the state of scientific agreement. So, so sort of in the, the the constitution of scientific advice, at least in the UK, is quite a wide ranging set of uh, things that they're. I mean. Advice is supposed to, uh, is wide scope. It's not a matter of simply sort of presenting the state of science, but of reaching all kinds of judgments about uh, the confidence that one can have in, the, in that science, as to say, <laughs> given the level of disagreement and uncertainty around it, but also uh, in making specific recommendations. Um, and, uh, 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 but in, in fact, uh, uh, at least the last of these, this reflection on the state of scientific agreement is done in a very narrow way. Um, so, so, I mean, I think that sort of that speaks to the motivation for, the, for, this, for this workshop is that it's largely confined, if you look at the reports coming out of SAGE and so on, to um, fairly technical reports on uncertainties in the models, and not wide scope reports on, on the state of scientific disagreement. Um, anyway, I mean, the basic uh, conditions that are, are faced during the, 
Well, I should say also just, I mean, in, because it's, it, it links up with, with Jonathan's point about sort of the, the second wave here. Uh, this is also, I think, uh, a, uh, some sense within the community that the system of scientific advice and, and the way that worked rather well in the second in the second wave. I mean, uh, in, in in this, uh, I can I'll just give you sort of one. So in the in the uh, uh, in, in the evidence given to the House of Commons uh, Health and Social Care and Technology um, Committee, uh, when when scientific advisors were sort of interrogated as to their relationship with their political masters during this phase and whether the relationship had gone well. Um, there seems to be a, there's a sort of consensus, at least in public statements by scientific advisors, that the system worked well, that they, um, uh, uh, so the scientists reported findings when they uh, were able to do so confidently and that the government responded appropriately to those things. So it, although it's true that, uh, in fact, the emergence of the of the that the new alpha variant had you know, just terrible consequences for the UK. And in fact, I mean, I think the health service came as close to collapse, uh, or cl came closer to collapse in the second wave even than in the first wave. Uh, and there's in the sort of you could sort of say in the in in the first time round, you know, nobody knew what they were doing. There was sort of, sort of disastrous. Um, judgments being made, maybe there was sort of group thing, that it, it doesn't, on the face of it, look like that was what was happening in the second wave. It looks like um, there was an attempt to, to make a, a reasonable scientific assessment of emerging risks, and it looks like the government responded to it. Of course, uh, there may be a sort of all sorts of contingent political reasons why they did so in this case. And yet, despite that, um, it was largely to, to no effect, and, and, and I think it is reasonable to ask the question, as Jonathan does, whether um, it was sufficiently precautionary, the responses that were made, and, if, and if, the, if the answer is yes or no on that, on what basis would one want to say that it was sufficiently or insufficiently um, precautionary? Okay, so, so let me uh, just try and make a couple of claims about that, that, that question, sort of namely what would be... Um, what would be a sort of reasonable standard here from which an assessment of that kind could be made. So the basic problem is that uh, the, the scientific advisors faced in that second wave, but in, in all, you know, throughout the pandemic, is that the state of science was such that there was a very wide range of projections, um, that, you know, reasonable projections that one could make about the outcomes of things that, that, that the interventions that could be made. Um, or, or put it in a, science was not such as to sort of rule out um, a very large number of possibilities. So, so basically you're operating in a, in a situation in which you're required as a scientific advisor to make direct policy recommendations um, on the basis of uh, a state of scientific understanding which you know uh, doesn't preclude you know, a very wide range of, of outcomes from these things. So you're, you're having to make policy recommendations knowing full well that the science does not tell you which is the best policy to, to pursue. Even setting aside the issue about sort of what sort of value judgments you're, you're drawing on, you can set aside. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what are you, what should you be doing under these circumstances? Well, uh, in effect, what what they were doing was making an in-house judgment about whether their confidence was sufficiently high, and when it went over that in-house judgment about uh, the, the, re the, the required threshold, then they made the recommendation. But there was no, no explicit identification of what that threshold was. And, uh, 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 and in fact, uh, as, as Jonathan hinted at, there, there are occasions when I think mistakes were made here. I mean, there was a misidentification of what the worst case would look like. Um, and so there were occasions in which recommendations were made that were insufficiently precautionary, and there are probably also cases where the opposite was true here. Um, so the fundamental issue really, and it's an issue that sort of here's the claim that should, needs to be absolutely explicit in the process of scientific advice, is to, um, uh, is to address the question of how much confidence uh, uh, scientists have to have in the claims that they want to make before they communicate. So by claims here, I mean claims about what's going to happen, but also 
recommendations. Um, and I think the, 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 uh, the point about the precautionary principle is that lack of confidence is not grounds for non-communication. It's not grounds for not making a judgment. And it's not grounds in general for non-communication because even low confidence judgments can be highly relevant in the sort of situations in which precautionary judgments have to be made. Why? Because these are situations in which the harm is of significant, is, the harm is sufficiently significant that what is at stake is systems maintenance. So even, I mean, one could justifiably, as a policymaker, say, if your best assessment, even if it's with very low confidence, is that the system could fail, then I want to know. Don't wait until you get over some internal scientific threshold for confidence in that judgment. But of course, what scientists themselves shouldn't be making the judgment is what counts as, that, as su sufficiently significant harm. So it would be equally wrong uh, if they didn't also, to the extent that they're capable of making uh, not only low confidence judgments, but also reporting um, the judgments that they can make with higher confidence, where there is, uh, which would necessarily be less precise. Um, and to offer their best estimates relative to these, you know, these less precise situations and offer those as um, actions that can be taken that will le less robustly achieve the goals, but which are available to politicians nonetheless. Um, last point, uh, where do these confidence judgments come from that uh, uh, the uh, um, that the scientists are supposed to be making, or who, who's making these judgments. Scientists are supposed to make these judgments, and they're supposed to make these judgments on the basis of their assessment of the state of, uh, of the evidence that's available at that time, the state of scientific understanding, but also in the state of agreement and disagreement within the scientific community. With this sort of idea here that you will report um, findings to, to the political masters with low confidence whenever you find yourself in a situation in which this relative informational scarcity or gaps in scientific understanding or a large disagreement within the community where the community could be wider than just the circle of advisors. So if you speak to the sort of Great Barrington Declaration and how to deal with them, uh, the fact that these kind of claims could be, could be grounds for reporting lower confidence in things. And of course, the, the opposite would apply. Okay.